podcast today. We will be using all the podcast cliches spoken in our best smooth Roman Mars impersonation from beautiful, <laughs> sunny downtown Denver, Colorado. We will answer your questions. Hopefully you have questions. We will have some laughs and also get to the heart of some hard-hitting emotional content. And most importantly, uh, we will speak with some very special guests. And when I put that in, my panelists are like, who are the guests? Yeah. <laughs> we have three uh, very special people, I have three very special people joining me up front here in uh, no particular order, but the order of their presentations. It is Kelly Cannon from MoMA, who is uh, involved with the Piece of Work, a uh, Piece of Work um, podcast. We have Hannah Hethman, who is the host of Museums in Strange Places, which I'm sure most of you have probably heard about. And uh, Evan Wyndham from the Bullock Texas State History Museum, who is the host and producer and everything else of the Texas Story podcast. Season one was about Stevie Ray Vaughan. Um, I listen to it for the music as well as the content, so okay. just saying. It's good music <laughs> and the content. Thank you. Now before I turn it over to the guests, I will tell you a little bit about the BCMA podcast and why I am up here. Um, as I sort of joked with my panelists, we had about as many listeners to the first three episodes as MoMA had working on their podcast, <laughs> and I'm listening to it. So uh, as an association, we work with many different museums, and so we were looking to do a monthly episode of a podcast about museum practice in British Columbia for museum practitioners in British Columbia. The idea was to add this to our sort of access anywhere resources, things like webinars, online resources, or digital programs. The episodes would connect museum workers to other leaders in the sector um, and within their fields, within the museum field. So I was the host because as a staff of three, I was the one who had a little bit of time. Uh, I was producing most of the other digital programs already, and I knew how to do some podcasting, the very basics. I also loved podcasts and really wanted to host one, so that's why I did. Now when I started the podcast, I wanted it to be an insightful discussion forum for museum workers, also to help promote the association both among its members and with potential members, uh, obviously because we get a bit of revenue from membership. And um, the, the organization itself had slightly different views for the podcast. <laughs> they had put the podcast into their strategic plan um, as something that would be a, a good resource for them to do. Um, and so because of that, it needed to tie in with organizational goals. I think we've all sort of been there on creative projects. Uh, so it was a little bit of a learning curve for me to find the proper place where this podcast fit. The big question was if the podcast was a resource or a mouthpiece for the organization, a promotional tool, um, whether it was an, an engaging, educational, entertaining sort of podcast, or whether it was sort of that promotional voice, um, or what, a learning tool? And I don't think we quite sorted that out uh, before I left, probably just because of that difference in the tone of voice, and also because of what we thought the podcast was gonna be. I was looking for just like a different topic each time, talk to cool people, hear about cool things. And while I did that, uh, the BC Museums Association also wanted it to tie into what they were doing. So uh, it was supposed to work towards a rotating three-month schedule of podcasts about an event that happened, um, a tie-in, sort of an audio tie-in to our quarterly magazine, and then something relating to a resource toolkit that we were creating at the time. So sort of like another way to engage with that content. Still would include a lot of interviews and, and whatnot, but um, not quite the same as me just going off getting an idea and talking to people about it. So I started it in March, that was the time we recorded our first episode, and we had a very tight deadline. Uh, we needed to have something live and on the website by April. So one month, obviously not much long-term planning, so I just went out and found people to talk to to begin with, and then we moved into that sort of three-month cycle and brought in some volunteers to help with it as well. Um, external volunteers, I should say, as well, so people from museums around the province. Uh, I also wondered if we could keep those themes going, those three themes, because of the unique content nature um, and I think that we probably could have by the, the sort of sounds of what we were getting in terms of interest. Um, but like I said, I left the organization after five months, five episodes, and so I don't know what has happened since then. I will also mention that we did have some production challenges, as you'll probably hear similar stories from my guests, and as you've probably heard from every presenter here this week, I did it off the side of my desk. Um, I did actually build in time for it, but of, of course, as with any new project, you can't really get rid of old things that you need to do, so it was very much uh, manage it within that. And because it was a monthly podcast, um, we needed to rush through a lot of things. There wasn't a lot of uh, early planning, um, sort of research, anything like that. And because it was interview-based, we weren't doing a lot of scripting. So if you had an interview that didn't go that well or that they didn't say what you wanted them to say, well, 
I hope you find another one. It was sort of that type of thing. So it became a little bit of a, of a, a an example or a, or a practice in podcasts, if you will, where you had to learn quick to try to get good content the first time. Um, also, because of timelines, I didn't have a lot of editing time, and I was working in an office that was actually a shared office, not just with staff from my own association, but with staff in a completely other association in an open room. So you can't really tell them to turn off their phones for an hour as you're trying to narrate over and over and over again and swearing because you're getting the, the words wrong and mumbling and all that sort of thing. So um, one external volunteer did do more of a narrative structure and they worked on that. But of course, because they did that separately, sometimes on their iPhone or sometimes on a different podcast recorder, you'd have different quality throughout. And because BC is such a big province, we were doing Skype interviews, the quality didn't really matter for me compared to what I was getting on the other line of the phone anyways. So we sort of gave up worrying about that too much. Interviews were often, like I said, by Google Hangouts, um, but we did do a little bit of in-person interviewing and that will bring me to what my studio for the first episode looked like. It was like this. <laughs> this is the inside of a 2003 Subaru Forester parked in the parking lot um, of the Gursik Temple and Sikh Heritage Museum in Abbotsford, BC, in the rain. I'm interviewing Luke Desmarais, who is a 2016 MCN scholar and a deaccessioning expert after he ran a deaccessioning workshop for our members there, where we had about 23 people. I should also mention, you can see at the top, there's that slider that goes over the, uh, uh, the sunroof. Um, that actually really helped. That really brought that rain sound out of the podcast. I was very surprised. It's uh, If you need to record in your car, do it. It works actually really well. So we chatted for about 15 minutes. He needed to go. I needed to catch a ferry. Uh, I got 12 minutes of content out of that 15 minutes. So that either shows how great an interviewer I am or how um, bad our editing was. I don't know. You can make up that decision. <laughs> we also got about five strange looks from people walking through the parking lot wondering why there were two grown men with microphones staring <laughs> forward out there and chill. We didn't look at each other the whole time. Our second episode, I will mention, was uh, primarily a conversation with my executive director, and we did record it in the library of Craig Derrick Castle, which is a historic mansion in Victoria, um, which was great. We did it before the public came in. But we realized, because we went far over time, as conversations do, that the staff was like standing around the corner, not breathing, because they needed to open up the room, and they didn't want to interrupt us in case it ruined our recordings. But anyways, those are stories for another day. Uh, I want to go straight into our special guests with me today. And so let's talk a little bit about podcasts. All of this leads to the questions we will be discussing um, with the, the guests at the table here. We are keeping the MCN theme of humanizing the digital in mind, and each of the guests will sort of explore different aspects of that as it relates to podcasts. Um, some of it might even relate to either this sentiment, there you go, the podcast or die sentiment at the beautiful Denver Art Museum. Thank you very much for this. Um, or the notion of podcasts being something everybody does and that it's actually more unique when you want to stop a podcast like this cartoon from The New Yorker in 2017. Um, we also have some people on the podcast who have very different views, so I hope that that will come out in our discussions. We have two people working within a museum, one person working with museums from the outside. We have two very different types of museums as well, um, and so I think that the conversations we're going to have are going to be really interesting. This episode will have three talks and maybe a question in between from me, and then we'll have a little dialogue between the four of us, which will open into a conversation with you. Uh, we really do want this to be sort of a call-in show, so feel free to have questions, write them down uh, as you think of them, and then we're gonna try to spend about 20 minutes or so at the end talking about it. So, with that, I'd like to invite my first guest, Kelly Cannon. Thanks, Ben. And um, also, I will not be using a smooth podcasting voice because I'm fighting a cold. So excuse any um, interferences from my, my cough. Um, so uh, I'm Kelly Cannon from the Digital Learning and Interpretation team in the Education Department at MoMA in New York. Um, and I'll be talking to you today about how and why we made a piece of work podcast. So if you've ever walked through MoMA's galleries and seen a bicycle wheel attached to a stool, a giant canvas splattered with paint, or a text-based work of conceptual art, you can understand that for many visitors, works like these understandably prompt a lot of questions <coughs> and strong reactions. At MoMA, we conduct research about what our visitors want to know about the art they encounter in our galleries, 
and we aim to tailor the content we produce, such as labels, audio guides, and other resources to address these topics and their questions. Despite that, <laughs> despite that, um, our analysis of online reviews of MoMA on TripAdvisor, Yelp, and Google reveal that um, many visitors are still frustrated with or completely dismissive of modern and contemporary art. Um, in fact, not quote unquote getting the art is one of the top complaints cited in negative reviews. So armed with this candid and helpful feedback, um, a team in the education department sees the opportunity to take a more creative and irreverent approach to our content. One that would meet visitors where they are, namely beyond the walls of the museum, and engage them without assuming that they liked or loved art at all. We wanted to capture a range of voices and perspectives, so we decided to make a podcast. And after making a pilot in-house, we realized we desperately needed some outside perspective and expertise. So after fleshing out our goals for the project internally, we partnered with WNYC Studios, which is a subsidiary of NPR that produces and distributes podcasts. We really admired how they have strategically diversified the voices and topics of their podcasts, and they embrace a more informal tone in effort to expand their audiences over the past few years. We knew they would not only bring an abundance of experience with audio production, but also a broader listener reach than our MoMA audience. We worked with their producers over several weeks to map out the topics and works of art that we wanted to cover in 10 episodes. And at first, we strictly adhered to the works that were cited in um, those visitors' re reviews, um, but we agreed that it would be a disservice to all to just address works by dead white men. So we broadened the range of makers and mediums covered to include performance art, video art, and design. One of the most significant decisions we had to make was who would be the host. WNYC stressed the importance of a compelling host, ideally one who already had their own public following. Um, and we came up with a list of people who we considered visual art adjacent. So people who are interested in the art world, um, but not necessarily in it. And we really hit the jackpot. Um, to our great delight, Abby Jacobson, who many of you may recognize as the co-creator and star of Broad City, um, signed on. She also went to art school and is an illustrator and big fan of MoMA. And from day one, she really got the mission. She didn't brush up on her art history in advance as she wanted to be an empathetic stand-in for a curious but skeptical visitor. Instead, she put her energy into having thoughtful and often hilarious conversations about the art with curators and educators and artists and with some of her celebrity friends. It was a truly incredible experience to listen to her talk with Questlove about escaping into the blue of Eve Klein's paintings, about him describing it as this kind of cabin in the woods, um, or describing and reacting to iconic 1960s performance art with RuPaul. <laughs> we punctuated their conversations with box of visitor reactions and insights on many of the same works. And I actually, given that, wanted to just take a moment to share with you um, a little excerpt from her conversation with Questlove. A monochrome print in his house. It was amazing. Does, does the print do it justice? Uh, I mean, the print reminds me that I don't own this yet. <laughs> but this and, is amazing. And so that's she's... Amir Thompson, founding member of the band The Roots, author, foodie, and most well known as Questlove. And he was very excited. He wanted us to move away from the piece of art a little bit. Oh, you're going to hurt it? <laughs> that's Casey, our engineer. Can you not hear? We were like. <laughs> Uh, so we, like were very, we were standing very close to the painting, like um, scarily close that we would we would damage it. Okay, I knew how close we were. <laughs> Nothing was gonna happen. Anyways, I don't think that I've seen a climb in person, or in, definitely not in this way, because this is like a more casual way to view it than on the museum wall, which is like kind of jarring. All right. But people are like, well, this is just blue. Like some people have a hard time with this. I fucking love it, See? but I'm. To me, this speaks more volumes than any amount of intricate art that's available. Because the print in my house, sometimes I'll sit and just, I'll just sit and stare endlessly at it because I don't know. It's, I just, what does it say to you? Does it calm you or? It definitely calms me. You know, 
60. He, I don't know. This is, I don't know. Those are soft dogs. I just like that that's a simple. See, it's good to hear your take on it because when uh, colors are more, what, what's the term, uh, synesthesia, I hear stuff when I see colors. Oh, wow. So there's a particular, I don't know, this just reads B flat to me, like a very low range B flat. So when I see it, I hear, I make it a get out reference. I go into a sunken place, like a, I hear a very deep, okay, I sound like the, the art snobs that I, I was love afraid it. I was. No, but the, you're not, you actually don't sound like an art snob. You sound like exactly what you do for a living and why you create music. So when you see shit, you yeah. hear like, I, I, tones and I, I hear sounds when I see it. So I think that's the primary reason why the print is in my house. That metaphor, the sound of So as with all digital projects, I can't overstate how important it is to have a launch plan. Our marketing and communications team worked on a coordinated press and social strategy for maximum impact. And during the launch period, we topped the charts on Apple's podcast and arts and culture podcasts. We've had 1.3 million downloads as of this fall and are happy to share that we won a 2018 Webby Awards for best arts and culture podcast. But more importantly, listeners love it. The podcast has received positive reviews from art lovers and skeptics alike. Many talk about it as Abby's podcast, suggesting that we succeeded in stepping outside of our institutional voice. We learned a lot from this project, but a few lessons stand out. One is to listen to the scathing feedback from your visitors, even if it hurts, to get a sense of where you are failing them or not resonating with their needs. Also, consider the benefits and trade-offs of collaborating across organizations. So while it took longer to communicate and establish shared goals up front, in the end, both MoMA and WNYC agreed that neither of us could have created this particular blend of content or achieved this grade of reach independently. And most importantly, given li listener response, we learned the power of making space for irreverent perspectives, non-expert voices, and real visitor reactions with art. So to conclude, um, you've already heard a little bit of the podcast, but I'm also gonna play um, a short trailer to entice you to listen to more um, if you haven't already. Hey, I'm Abby Jacobson. Maybe you know me from Broad City, but I do other stuff. I mean, I do a lot. I'm extremely busy. I'm also an artist. I went to art school and everything, but it's actually been a few years since I've been able to go and look at art and appreciate it and think about it. So I'm diving back in. MoMA's letting me wander their galleries for a new WMIC Studios podcast called A Piece of Work. This summer, I talked with some of my friends like Questlove, Tavi Gevinson, and RuPaul, and I'm in it too. I mean, I am all over this podcast. Look at me in that turtleneck. <laughs> I also get to talk to some experts and artists and curators, and I learned some incredible things. So buckle up, baby, because we're in for a wild ride. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This is a good one. They should, should do some marketing to get this guy known, right? <laughs> So Kelly, I have, I have one follow-up question as Hannah is getting her talk ready. Um, other than the fact that you managed to eventually reach as many listens as my podcast did, um, <laughs> DCMA podcast that you're all familiar with, um, did, the, did the podcast itself change the way the TripAdvisor ratings were being put in? Um, these, you know, you showed two different ratings there, one was iTunes, one was TripAdvisor. Did you see anything within the visitors coming in that referenced that they had listened to the podcast or that it had sort of influenced their view of, of MoMA? You know, that's a really good question that I didn't prepare for by checking the TripAdvisor reviews um, and ratings recently. But, um, but I can say that I think that the, 
some of the ratings that we saw, some of the reviews um, were from similar people, or coming from similar perspectives as the reviews that um, prompted the project in the first place. So people who were like, yes, like I, I hated these works, <laughs> and, and now, and now I, you know, I might, I might be more interested in engaging with them, or you know, I, I may still not like buy it, but, um, but I, I. I'm willing to listen to an argument for it, or, or to talk about it, or to listen um, to other people talking about it. Um, and we've, um, well, I'll go into this maybe a little bit more later, but we've, we've since introduced excerpts of the podcast into other um, platforms, and I've seen some positive responses there, too, with people um, uh, um, explaining that they like the conversational tone of hearing about an artwork rather than just having one like authoritative voice telling them about an artwork. Thank you very much. And we will talk about some other stuff in terms of like where you listen to them and how that impacts podcasts a little bit later on. I know there are some people that probably have questions about that. But in the meantime, please welcome my second guest, Hannah Heffern. <laughs> Good woos in the back. Um, I need help already. Go right. Mm -mm. Okie dokie. So, for those of you that don't know me yet, I am Hannah Heffman. I am a independent consultant specializing in all things podcasting and museums. I am the host of Museums in Strange Places, a podcast about exploring the world through its museums. Has anyone listened? Yeah, oh, uh, oh wow, well, that's nice, thank you. Um, I hope you liked it, so I'm going to just say thank you, assuming you did. Um, I'm also the author of Your Museum Needs a Podcast, a step-by-step -step guide to podcasting on a budget for museums, history organizations, and cultural nonprofits. I have a free copy for everyone in here today, I think. Um, so if you have to leave, I'll give them outside to you outside um, after the session, but if you have to leave early, they're in a bag by the door, just grab one, um, please. Um, so I'm going to be talking for the next few minutes about an important engagement lesson I learned while podcasting um, and producing the first episode uh, season of my podcast in Iceland and then the second in Maryland. <clears throat> so the basic premise of Museums in Strange Places is this. I, each season I visit a different state, country, or region and explore it through its museums. Uh, in each episode, I talk, visit a different museum and talk to a different high-level staff member. Um, I talk about the museum's collections, programs, origin story, and whatever else is interesting to me because it's my podcast and I don't have a museum to tell me what I can and can't do. Um, so it's a walking and talking podcast because I can't stand still, um, which means the listener gets a lot of the sounds and feels of being in the museum uh, I like to describe it as a VIP museum people tour of any institution. To complete the experience for my listeners, I add in uh, field recordings of the area or the museums, uh, similar sounds like the rumble of a volcano for a volcano museum up there, and an original track from a different local musician in each episode just to keep people's interest going. So how did I end up in Iceland podcasting about museums? In spring 2017, uh, I was working at AASLH and I found out I'd won a Fulbright grant to go to Iceland for nine months to learn the Icelandic language uh, and research uh, Icelandic museum culture. So goodbye, um, Yekhaiti Hanna. That's about all I learned. I spent a lot of time on the podcast. <laughs> it turns out it's a lot more time consuming than uh, you'd think. So <clears throat> while I was planning how I would accomplish this, the idea of a podcast just sort of popped into my head. I bought $300 worth of equipment off Amazon and I uh, downloaded free editing software from the internet and started emailing and Facebooking Icelandic museum directors, because you can do that there, um, asking if I could interview them. Um, I ended up recording at 21 museums all over Iceland, which was an incredible experience. Um, this is a picture of me at the uh, Shark Museum in Bjarnehöp on the Snæfellsnes Peninsula, where a single family is the largest fermenter of shark meat in Iceland. Um, uh, and on the right is a picture of me on the top of a still steaming volcano, El Fjell, 
um, which I had to climb as research for my interview with a museum at the foot of the volcano, which told the story of its eruption. Um, I also got to meet the Icelandic president. Oh, no, where'd that slide go? There we go, and tell him about my podcast, which has nothing to do with anything. I just thought it was cool and that you should know. Um, <laughs> I met the president. So for my first season, um, second season, I was very planned. I was really organized. First season, I was really haphazard about where I went. Um, a lot just depended on the weather, where I could get to in the winter in Iceland. Um, so because of that, I ended up uh, visiting a lot of museums that were kind of meh. I mean, there's like no other way to put it. Like, you know, like a meh museum, right? It's so like meh, like if you're there, it's fine. So this is obviously a, a meh museum. We have phones from the 80s, uh, household cleaning products. And this is not like, I'm not uh, leading you with pictures. This is the best pictures I took in the institution. So here's a lesson. If you're drifting off, this is the time to come back and get your Twitter fingers ready um, with the tweetable bits. So no matter how average or boring or met these museums were, I ended up leaving a passionate supporter for life. Like, like in love, I love this museum now. Um, when I walked in, I was kind of like, what did I get myself into? But the crazy thing is, so did my listeners. This is the um, best listened to episode of 22 episodes. It included an episode about the Penis Museum, okay? And this one was more popular. Um, so how, how did that happen? Um, these are some of the people I interviewed during my time, uh, and they gave me VIP tours. Um, they were people, this is a lot of one person, two people institutions in Iceland. They have a lot of museums, but rarely do they have more than three staff members. Um, and I got a VIP tour from the people who are most passionate about their museums. Uh, they told me not just about what was on the walls, but about the origin stories of the museum, which were often very weird. Um, and uh, they told me about their challenges, about dealing with a tourist boom. They told me about what they are hoping for, what wasn't going well. Um, they told me about funding issues. So I got to know them um, through stories that I definitely, maybe definitely wouldn't have seen or heard if I just visited the museum. Um, it was a very different experience in the same place. I, I had a similar experience when I was recording for the second season of my podcast, which was in Maryland. I went to 21 museums there. Um, so try and tell me that one of the museums I went to isn't amazing. I will fight you, okay? Don't say anything bad about the Calvert Marine Museum. They let me go behind the scenes in their aquarium and see baby seahorses and meet the otters. So, um, like, a fan for life. So, what if, what if, so this is great for me and listeners in Museum Strange Places, but what's the takeaway? So what if, Every museum visitor got to experience an intimate one-on-one -on -one tour with a senior staff member um, and hear about both the subject matter, but all the work and passion that goes into keeping museums running and exciting. I mean, it, it, just imagine what that would look like at your museum. You'd have a powerful fan base of people who care deeply, not just about what's on the walls, but about the museum's health and success and whether there's enough money to replace the roof, you know? So, of course, for most museums, I can think of two that can do this. Um, for most, it's not logistically or financially possible for to offer that kind of experience. Like, that's just not possible. It'd be wonderful in a fictional world. But through podcasting, we can deconstruct this wall between the visitor experience and museum operations, offering our audiences a more intimate look at the institutions we love and letting them develop emotional connections um, with our museum on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And this is what happened with my podcast. People were so, they cared about Yona, who, who was at the industry museum with those crazy pictures and the stories she told and the love that she had for her community and her little institution and the random Iceland, old Icelandic guys in the background helping her fill in information Icelandic who couldn't speak English to me. So just chatting away in the background. People fell in love with that. Podcasting is an incredibly intimate medium. People often listen alone, and the voices in their favorite shows, right in their ear, right here, uh, become an, in a, a, a regular part of their day or week. Um, they're like friends. That's why podcast sponsorship is such a valuable advertising method, because people trust their favorite podcasters. 
I love this line from a writer I found. Podcasts fill in the gaps in your days with intimacy. Of all the media available at the moment, podcasting is the most like a relationship. Can anyone relate to that? Yeah? I mean, I can. I know, like, to be personal, um, I was at a podcasting conference this summer, and I went into a session and realized that the host and creator of my favorite audio drama, Girl in Space, was there, and I heard her start to speak, and I almost started to cry, and afterwards I went up and gave her a hug because, I mean, it's a great show, but I had been listening to her show at a time, a few months of my life that was really dark. I was dealing with a family loss and the loneliness of being in a new country by myself and going for a walk and listening to her voice was deeply comforting and it was, yeah, it filled in the gaps in my day with intimacy. So this is the power of podcasting, to paradoxically turn listeners uh, to paradoxically turn listening to audio on your own, in headphones, this kind of stereotypically um, detached experience into a truly human, intimate, and connective experience. And at the same time, to turn casual visitors or audience members into people who will fight anyone who disses your museum. So I wanna wrap up with three practical action points that you can implement when you go home at the end of the week, whether or not you wanna do a podcast. So one, encourage everyone in your museum to notice, document, and share the magical and mundane moments that happen behind the scenes in your museum. It, it may seem average to you, but your audience will love the vulnerability, the humanity, and passion they see. It will help them become emotionally invested in the museum's success. Two, tell your museum's story. Your museum is a story, just like the, your parents are a story and how you came to exist on this planet is a story that you may tell over and over at uh, family events. So tell the story of your museum. How did it come to be? Um, how did it come to be what it is today? Um, tell it to each other, tell it to your guests. Um, people want to be part of stories. So tell your museum story and invite visitors to write their own chapter in that story by allowing them to become part of that story. Three, consider podcasting as a medium that allows intimacy between a museum and thousands of individuals, one at a time. Brainstorm how you could use podcasting to allow visitors a deeper experience of one particular aspect of your museum's subject or work. And if podcasting isn't right for you, which it's not for everyone, I'll, I, I'll admit that, um, find another way to build that intimacy and human connection into your museum experience, whether it's personal or digital. And I'd like to wrap up with the trailer for season two of my podcast, Museums of Maryland, um, which released yesterday. So will this work if I, how do I do this? We have dropped the velvet ropes. Yes, we are a very political space. If you're primarily about things, then you're a repository for dead things. You're a mausoleum. But if you're truly a museum, you're all about the inspiration and you're about communicating that to everybody who walks in of all ages and finding a way for them to digest something so delicious that it will be inspirational to them in their lives. If you think about overcrowded tenement housing and trash cans in the street and children playing in the gutters and laundry hanging between the buildings, Greenbelt was the antidote to that. What does it mean to be black in the age of information? Whether you're a science museum or a natural history museum or an art museum or a technology museum, we're all about the story. That's what we do. We're storytellers. Museums are the keepers of our history and culture. 
but they are also reflections of who we are now. Welcome to Museums in Strange Places. I'm your host, Hannah Hesman, a museum consultant specializing in podcasting for museums. And this is a show for people who love museums, stories, culture, and exploring the world. In each season of this podcast, I explore a different country, state, or region through its museums. In season one, I traveled around Iceland. For season two, I decided to explore my native state of Maryland. I visited 22 of Maryland's most interesting and unique museums, including America's first purpose-built museum, a repository of oral histories from a remote island's fading waterman culture, a historic synagogue, a black history wax museum, a New Deal era public housing utopia, the house where Edgar Allan Poe published his first poem, one of the earliest nursing schools in the country, and so many more. On November 14th, tune in to hear the first three episodes of Museums in Strange Places Season 2, Museums in Maryland. Join me on my latest adventure and discover what stories these incredible cultural institutions hold and how they reflect and shape Maryland's unique identity. Okay, so that's my presentation. Um, <laughs> And just because of time, we are going to save my question to be your question at the end. So let's go straight on to Evan Wyndham uh, and our final guest of the podcast. So honored to be a guest. <laughs> no? Which one? Tech people. <laughs> There's podcasts, but moving slides forward, I'll tell you. Let me get my water. I'm fighting a cold too, sorry. <laughs> okay. Hey. Thank you. Okay. Hello. Um, I'm Evan Windham with the Bullock Texas State History Museum in Austin, Texas. Um, I'm the web and digital media manager there, so I'll be presenting just briefly on um, our podcast, which is Texas Story Podcast Stevie Ray Vaughan. Quite a mouthful, but here we go. So I'll get to the essence of why we're here, the existential question, why podcasts? Um, but for us, it was really a practical situation. Uh, we were thinking about experimenting, what kind of projects can we do? We threw a bunch of stuff on the board and we kept coming back to podcasts. And we came back to that for a very, for a couple of essential reasons um, for us. Three of those namely. One was the production threshold was relatively low. We had some recording equipment already. And by that, I mean a Tascam recorder and some microphones. Um, and we are a small department of three people and really at its core, you need one person to press record and know how to drop files in an order, and we can do that. So we were like, okay, check that box. Um, the outreach potential was also extremely high, right? You put that content out there, anyone can, re can reach it from anywhere that they are on their own device. Um, and our department is built, uh, was built out of funding from the Texas State Legislature called the uh, Statewide Initiative. So that's core and foundational to how we approach things, is uh, representing everyone in the museum and the outreach as well. That was another box. Um, and it can be evergreen. This content can be evergreen in the face of ever-changing content. Something uh, pretty interesting about our museum being a history museum, um, we rely on other institutions for their collections. Everything on view in our museum is on loan. So our content is always changing, our artifacts are always changing. So this was a cool way that we could have something up, even if the artifact wasn't there, even if the exhibition itself wasn't there anymore. So we're like, okay, great, this, this could be a viable option for us. Um, as we're pitching this to our boss, the director, we were thinking about content then, what could we do? And we identified a couple of low-hanging fruits, um, speakers that were already coming to the uh, museum to do their lectures, 
uh, lenders when they drop off their, I shouldn't say drop off, when they um, <laughs> give us their art, when they come to give us their artifacts. We could understand what that meant to them. So in addition to the story the curators are trying to tell, we could have like a really intimate conversation is what does this object mean to you? Um, and also behind the scenes content and the exhibition process, uh, which is super popular on all of our social media accounts. Uh, you post a picture of people making mounts and they're like, oh my gosh, that's so cool, that's amazing. And I, I was a new employee at the time that we were really thinking about this and I was super jazzed to be in a museum. Uh, so I made a very passionate speech to my boss at the end of my review and I was like, oh my gosh, it's so cool what we do here and things are always changing and I got to know a curator and she thought this was the story but she learned something else and we were doing this. And for better or for worse, um, I made that passionate plea. And while we had a, <laughs> a really good reaction to it, we weren't greenlit at the time until an exhibition was coming right around the corner, which is Pride and Joy, the Texas Blues of Stevie Ray Vaughan. And out of curiosity, how many people know who Stevie Ray Vaughan is? Wow, okay. <laughs> That's a lot of people. I didn't know who he was. Oh, I know, I'm so sorry. <laughs> so I'll see myself out, you can listen to me. <laughs> I just didn't. Um, all right, for those who don't know, I'll just refresh myself. Stevie Ray Vaughan and his band, uh, Double Trouble, rose to prominence in the 80s, won a slew of major awards. He was killed in a helicopter crash in 1990. Um, and he's very important to the state of Texas, in particular, Austin. He is an icon of the Austin music scene. Um, and the show itself is curated by the Grammy Museum at LA Live. Our stop was guest curated as well by Jimmy Vaughn himself, uh, who brought a lot of memorabilia and content. And we knew that it would be very popular with people that were familiar with the story. Um, and we saw that that was a way that we could have a story up popular with people. You know, we could tell the story that people were familiar with in a different way, um, fill in the people that didn't know, and it would be up it would be, it's an important thing that then would be up once the exhibition was gone. Um, so a key thing that we did though, in thinking about how to make this, yes, his name is spelled wrong on that. I was shocked as well. Um, <coughs> but we actively took steps once we knew, okay, we're doing a podcast. We took steps to make it a less traditionally curatorial tone, meaning that it's not a biographical lecture, like, it doesn't start with Stevie Ray Vaughan was born this, in this time, and then go, et cetera. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, to do that, we used a personal journey to be the touchstone of the narrative. Um, and that personal narrative was by someone unfamiliar with the subject matter. I can guess, I can, I can assume that you can guess who that was. Um, and so, because we did that, it's the, the, <laughs> the journey of, the uh, discovery of the history, it's not just the facts. That was important to us to show um, history doesn't just happen and we just know history. We're constantly learning it. Our interpretation is constantly changing as well. So um, key to this as well was that because I wasn't a subject matter expert, all of the conversations that I had with people, they were geared more towards large concept, human concept things, um, love, loss, family, uh, meeting someone so cool for the first time, you're like, I just gotta be around this guy. He knows what's up. So um, how we actually produced this, <laughs> which I'm kind of regretting putting this up there because I didn't know it was gonna be that big, but um, it was very much a solo venture at first. Uh, I had given that passionate plea and my boss was like, awesome, you know how to do the tech stuff and you're not a subject matter expert, you are the voice. And I was like, ooh. I'm an introvert, I don't do that stuff. Um, so I talked to anybody that would talk to me and my conversations lasted anywhere from 20 minutes to four hours in some guy's house. Uh, that sounded really bad. You know. um, and I recorded all of my personal reflections as well after the conversations um, and after all the concerts that I went to, blues clubs that I hung out in and all of that kind of stuff. And so I gathered all the content and I looked at that to make the story and there was a definite thing that came out of that, absolutely. But the very first challenge that I came across was that I had been given all of this license in an excellent way that I could do all of this stuff, 
But I had, in the back of my mind, I was representing the institution. So I wasn't sure how personal I could get with my narrative. Uh, for example, uh, it just so happened by coincidence, I was recording the episode about his death on the anniversary of my aunt's death two years prior, uh, which is obviously something that I am still working with. But I have this amazing uh, conversation of me just trying to work through this thing that happened in my family and comparing my relationship to my sister, my mother to her sister that had just passed away, and Jimmy to Stevie. Um, and so, but I wasn't sure if the institution was okay with putting that out there. Um, and so we actually did bring on another person onto this project, and we said that we were the special guests, but I know he's in here. So he's in here. Um, and so this was definitely a two-person thing. Um, and he came in and was super helpful with rewriting the scripts and doing editing, editing of the, the uh, audio better than I could have ever done. Um, and another challenge that we ran into was time and money. It might be <laughs> shocker, um, because time is money as well, right? So then we had two people working on this, uh, more than we expected. And uh, this was my recording booth, my closet at home. Had I known that it would be up here, I probably would have cleaned it a little bit better. <laughs> but that's the authenticity that we're going for here. Um, podcast. Yeah, it's podcast. And so we were also juggling other projects to get into the clubs that we were going into. We relied on our institutions or other partnerships in town. Um, and like we went to ACL Live and they were like, sure, we can get you passes, but you can't, we, we can't really do anything about you meeting the band. So a colleague and I were trying to meet the band in a very almost famous way. So a ton of anecdotes about that. But um, we also tested the early scripts, the early uh, prototypes, I guess you'd say, on colleagues, but they were pretty strapped for time as well. So we tested it on our friends and family, just like, what is working? Anybody that would listen, we'd listen to. And it shifted from radio drama stuff. Uh, I think the first episode still has some legacy like sound effects that were like typing and all that, um, to really just being a, a long form narrative and a story that came across. Um, but another challenge that we just had to accept that was that we didn't tell the entire story. So many of the people that I interviewed, um, so many anecdotes like those that I just um, shared are not included, but we had to sacrifice the completeness for the story of all the content that we had gathered um, for the story, that, that main story that we were trying to tell. Um, so in the end, uh, if you've listened to our podcast, I have an exchange with someone at this statue. This is the statue where this happened. Um, but what we got out of it was where it's an anthology series. Season one is about Stevie Ray Vaughan. It is one subject. It is five episodes uh, driven by a personal narrative. It's grouped conceptually, not biographically. Um, so it's just that basic logical sense of how do you find things. Uh, the pilot episode, for example, the first thing you do when you hear new music is you listen to the musician. So that was me listening to Stevie for the first time and then talking with the band and being like, do you remember listening to him for the first time? Like, yeah, that was, we were out hanging or whatever and go on from there. Um, logistically, we had three in the can when we started releasing them during the exhibition. We didn't make it in time for before the exhibition. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're still working on two as we were releasing them. We released them weekly. And um, yeah, that's pretty much the basics. I'll cut it there for you. <laughs> Questions? Awesome. <laughs> check, check, check. Check, check, check. Okay, cool. We're gonna do audience questions now. Let's talk more about that. Let's go to the phones. Caller number one. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm curious to the panel about how you go about researching in order to come up with questions for your interviews. Like, how do you pull those really wonderful stories out of people? Is this on? Okay. Um, just to give maybe a half, there's a page in my book where I have this. But um, so, especially my second season where I thought more about it, there's this, I recommend like at least 15 to 20 minutes of like research ahead of time. 
So Google search for me, my subject, and of course it's a small museum, there's not a lot out there, but find out what you can, make sure that what there is to know about the person or the subject, you know, so that you're not um, spending your time asking, you're not missing out on asking something that they're not offering to tell you. And then the second, hmm? Okay, sorry. <laughs> what? Uh, and then the second thing for me is to, uh, there was a great UX session uh, earlier that talked about this, be an active listener. Um, so just be listening so that you really hear what they're saying mm -hmm. and follow up with a question that you want to know. Um, don't just go to your next written question. So I actually went away pretty early from written questions because they made me jump to subjects that were new when there was something that after listening to the recording, I was like, oh, I wanna know more. Um, and then lastly, have your follow-up uh, tools. So what's another way to say that? Um, could, you, could you explain that to me a different way? Like, what do you mean by that? Or can you clarify? Or, um, and how do you feel about that, right? Like, so these questions that get people to dig a little more because sometimes people say something and you want them to say that thing, but you want them to say it better. So get them to say it four times, like without them realizing they're repeating themselves, or just ask them to repeat it, but often to prompt them would be my big tips. You did interviews, though. I did interviews. Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, was, I would say exactly the same, um, because I wasn't a subject matter expert, right? I think a lot of people came into me thinking, I was worried. This was a vulnerability for me, thinking, you know, I'm sitting across from this person who's won a Grammy, and I, you know, he has done, uh, interviews his entire life mm -hmm. and I'm just like hey do you remember hanging out with your friend and um, how the conversation goes from there just follow that conversation you know organically yeah yeah and keep prodding mm -hmm. nicely uh, so I'm kind of wondering uh, what kind of feedback y'all have gotten and this is maybe more of a question for Kelly and Hannah but uh, what kind of feedback have you gotten from listeners about uh, presenting on an audio platform information about a visual medium. Mm. And uh, even though you might have a companion blog post or something like that, um, people might be driving in their car listening to this. And have you gotten much feedback from people about you know, wanting to see what they're hearing about and not maybe understanding fully what it would be like visually? Especially when using video to promote them as we talked about. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the questioner was about medium height, and he had some glasses that suggested he was maybe a little bit of a hipster, a little bit um, fashionable, but um, he clearly was interested in knowing more, and you could see that in his face. And so you can describe the situation to people in a way that um, there's a great, um, How Sound is a podcast about podcasting. It's made by the people who do like PRX and stuff. And there's this, you need to, especially with a visual medium or a place, you have to find, just like a book, you know, like no one goes, oh God, this book doesn't have pictures, right? Or some people do. You have to find the elements that people need to know. So what do they need to know in order to know something about like this hotel? You wouldn't describe the carpets, you'd describe the wall art, right? Mm -hmm. So it's about finding the right amount of description. You can do that in the interview. You can prompt your interview subject to do that. So tell me what we're seeing now. You can add in sound effects that connect people visually, like they hear, water running, they'll see water running. Um, so I haven't had any complaints. Um, it's because I think you're painting a picture no matter what. Um, and if you do it properly, they don't need to see it. And you might even be a let down to see it <laughs> a lot of times. Um, yeah, I would agree with that actually. Um, and, and so something that um, uh, when these were released, we always had a social media campaign that accompanied it and you would see the images that were a part of it. So if you had learned about it through social, you might be familiar with the images that were featured in each episode. Um, and then on WNYC's and MoMA's website, we have the images too. But of course, a lot of people aren't looking at the images at the same time. And so um, we definitely took, I think, I think we partnering with WNYC was an interesting um, way to approach this because they were able to really work with us on sound design um, to help evoke um, the experience of, of, or help put listeners into a kind of mind frame of um, thinking about um, and listening to someone talk about art. So one episode that comes to mind in particular is um, the episode on, we talked about James Terrell, um, uh, one of the rooms in which yeah, as you're laying down in it and you're looking up and, and the, sun, the sun is setting and the colors in the room change. Um, and there were these tonal effects um, that, that uh, you would hear 
um, as Abby was really slowly narrating, like, close your eyes, envision the brightest pink you've ever seen, like slowly, you know, spreading across your field of vision. And so she found really creative ways, I think, of talking through some of these um, works of art. Yeah. Um, so I think we, we tried to approach that as a creative challenge. Um, and um, and in, in the excerpt that I played, um, Questlove also talks about, um, you know, he says, like, this sounds to me like a B flat or I'm not a music person, so, but I know it was a music note. And then we played that note at the same time. So trying to use different senses, um, especially oral senses, to, to get there. Evan, did you want to answer that one too? Or? Um, I will say uh, my background is in film and web stuff. And part of the reason why I was like, hey, this will be pretty easy because it's picture and audio. This is just audio. Um, that's not to scare anybody that's trying to do that, but it's different. It's painting that entire picture of are we looking at something? Am I feeling something? How are we getting that across? And that's how I realized that I'm a very quick speaker when I'm excited. I get excited a lot. Um, so, you know, just kind of rethinking it in that way of like, okay, what is the story? Like reading a book um, and how painting that picture. I'm fascinated by old radio dramas. So um, that's what I tried to think about. So for the listeners at home, I am now in the audience passing over the mic to our question number three. Hello, uh, Ed, long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for your call, Ed. Uh, realistically, um, what percentage of your time is spent doing the editing and the behind the scenes and the legwork getting the interviews scheduled versus how much time you actually spend doing the interviews? And I'll take my question up here. <laughs> Speaking of time, yeah, we do only have two minutes total. No quick lightning round? Go. Quick answer. Quick lightning round. That's a great question because I kicked it off essentially to an editor to do that. Can I call in my special guest? Can I call in somebody? Yeah. Neil? Hello. Hello, the man behind the curtain. Can you answer on the editing? Oh, Neil, hold on. I've got a mic to you. Can you comment quickly on how many hours you spent gathering? Um, I have about 40. Uh, I'd say probably about 80, 80 hours. 80 hours. Yeah. And, and for each 20 minute episode, we probably spent 20 hours in post. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I spend anywhere from 10 to up to 50 hours in production, um, but that depends on, it's gotten faster, I've gotten better, um, but it depends on how long the audio recording is. So if I'm working in two hour audio to a 30 minute episode or 40 minute audio to a 30 minute episode, um, how good I was at interviewing, so how much I had to cut, um, how many times someone did this um, in their conversation, how fast they talked, and I'd like figure out a way to like cut it and slow it down. So, but yeah, ten to fifty. Um, and well, as Ben made the joke, we had um, a very amazing team of people working across WNYC and MoMA um, over several months. So, um, I think it would be impossible to calculate the hours, but it was. It sure felt like a lot of hours, but, <laughs> but, but a lot of great hours working with truly an amazing team of collaborators. Yeah. yeah, thank you. In the interests of time, I'm going to wrap uh, this episode up. Picture the theme music behind us. We didn't get the copyright for it, but yeah, exactly. Uh, sing it along in your own head. And uh, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. We didn't end up getting all of our Twitter handles up here, as you can see. Um, but what I can do is I can go right back up to the top and oh, almost the top. There you go. And that. Uh, feel free to tweet us if you do have any extra questions. Um, and we hope that you have a great time here at MCN. So thank you very much. Oh, and books. Books are at the door right there. Thank you, everybody. That's 80 hours included on this existential